I mentioned empty bowls a little bit ago, and many of us have been talking about that. It really was a great time yesterday. I was talking to one person. You strike up conversation, talking about different things while you're sitting over many, many bowls. I think I had about 20 or 22 bowls of soup or something like that. So we're talking, and uh, she mentioned that she had lived in California for a little while. I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, where, where did you live? And she mentioned Riverside, California, and some of the surrounding areas, and that's several hours from where I'm from, but I, but I kind of know the area. And, and, uh, and she said, yeah, I lived there for a few years, but something happened that, that made her pretty eager to get back home to Carolina. And when she mentioned it, I knew exactly what she was talking about. It was in October of 1989 that there was a massive earthquake that rocked the state. Now, really the last major earthquake that they've had. And I was, I was young, but I remember it very well. I was actually at the bank with my mom when it happened. And it actually hit during the World Series, during this, this great sort of epic regional um, rivalry between the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's. And so it happened on live TV, which kind of added to it because all of America watching this game watched this massive earthquake hit in California. And uh, it caused about $6 billion worth of damage, and 63 people lost their life. I mean, it was, a, it was really, again, the last major earthquake that they've had, but it was one to remember for sure. But I noticed something interesting, and actually it had sort of been in my mind, I was thinking about this as I came home, that um, something happened, something very similar happened on the other side of the continent just a few weeks before. So this was in uh, October of 1989. In September of 1989, so just a few weeks, the strongest, one of the strongest hurricanes to ever hit the Carolina coast made landfall. Maybe some of you remember Hurricane Hugo. So it, it, was, it was extremely destructive. It, uh, it was a Cat 5 hurricane when it was out at sea, 150 mile per hour winds. I mean, this was an incredible storm. It eventually downgraded to a Cat 4 as it hit, but it still brought 140 mile per hour winds in excess against the Carolina coast. And it was just devastating. It did $11 billion worth of damage, and it came right up through Charleston and basically followed the interstate up through Columbia and all the way into Western Carolina. I mean, it's just, just an incredible storm. The storm took 67 lives, as I said, $11 billion in damage, just a few weeks before, but on the other side of the continent from an earthquake. And, you know, when we step back for a moment, we think about it, and it, does, it won't take very long for it to start piling up more stories like this, whether it's an earthquake or a hurricane or a series of tornadoes or floods or heat waves or blizzards, we can't help but realize and recognize that this earth is a, it's a dangerous place. We, we know that it's beautiful in many ways. Of course, we, we recognize that. But that actually is even more curious, that with such beauty in the world, such wonder in the world, how is it, why is it that things are the way they are? And it's not just the natural world, is it? I mean, crises strike us in more personal ways, right? Relationally. Uh, financially, and certainly physically. I mean, at the end of the day, all of us, we realize the older we get, our bodies are wearing out. Why? We all experience pain in this life and loss. And if we thought about it, just for a little while, we might ask, are these things connected? Sort of the, the what is sometimes seems to be chaos in the natural world with the things that we experience in our own lives. Are these things connected? Well, when I last preached, which was two, two weeks ago, Chris preached for us last week, uh, I made the point that we must go to the Bible to answer these great questions of our lives. Not that we can't find any answers anywhere else, but we must go to the Bible first and foremost. Well, does the Bible then help us understand what seems to be such an astounding mixture in this world of beauty and pain? Well, rest assured, the Bible helps make sense of this world in a way that is superior to any other source that you will ever find. And it's on this point that I want to take you to Romans chapter 8. Please turn there with me. Romans 8, and we'll begin in verse 18. And I've titled this message, The Groans of Creation. Romans 8, beginning in verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. For the creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself might be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory 
of the children of God. Verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this world, or excuse me, for in this hope we were saved. There are three main ideas that I want to draw out of the text and help us think about today as we try to make sense of this dilemma, a world of beauty and yet a world of darkness and pain. And this first one that I want to look at is really the crucial background to this whole story. So number one, why creation is groaning. Why creation is groaning. As Paul writes these words, Genesis 3 and Genesis 1 through 3 really echoes in the background. In the first two chapters of Genesis, the book tells us the story of creation, creating the world, creating humanity. We all know the story. God made this world, and it was good. It was very good. It's it's nothing, there's no exaggeration to say that this creation, as God made it, was truly paradise. He created man in his image, and the whole of earth was given to man for his pleasure, for his goodness. It was given to him his dominion. Take the world, it is yours. Enjoy it, make something of it. There was no death, there was no pain, no sickness, no loss, but all of this changed when Adam and Eve sinned. Just what seems to us a very short time later in Genesis chapter three. God's good creation in that moment became cursed. When Adam and Eve fell, the good creation was changed. And it affected the natural world, of course. It affected humanity itself, most importantly. Again, the pinnacle of God's creation. Humanity, man and woman, created in his image. You realize it's because of sin, and only because of sin, that our bodies die. And it's because of sin that the beautiful world of wonder around us is also a place of terror. We see already in the second generation, we see murder. Again, not not just one sin of many, but we see murder when Cain kills his brother in cold blood. The first children born in this world is a place of terror. Ever since the fall in Genesis 3, this world has been, to use Paul's words, groaning. In verse 20 of our text, Paul says that creation was subjected to futility. We don't use the word futility very much, but I I hope that it's fairly clear here what he's meaning. Because of the fall, the created order, creation itself, has failed, in other words, to live up to its purpose. It's failed to live up to the good things, the great and glorious things that God created it for. One commentator, Tom Schreiner, says it really well. He says, the futility, decay, and frustration of the present world signal its incompleteness and failure to reach its full potential so the world was created for something marvelous magnificent and yet because of its futility because it has been subjected in this way it has failed to fulfill that potential all the great wonder and beauty in this world and of course you know we're not surprised that the world is so wonderful it was created by god god is wonderful god is beautiful god is good and so the world reflected that and yet the world has suffered in futility ever since sin entered the world. Another commentator, F.F. Bruce, helps explain that since the fall of creation, the world has been enslaved. Paul's going to use the word bondage. The world has been enslaved to malignant powers, evil forces that were not present before. It was after the fall that the forces of darkness find and are actually permitted to have a foothold in this world. But don't misunderstand. It's not the devil that subjected the world to its futility. We must not understand, misunderstand who subjected it. It was God who did so. And maybe you're inclined to ask, well, why? Why, why would God do that? Again, the, you know, created the world for a good purpose, and, and doesn't he love humanity? You know, why, why is it that God would then you know, subject the world in this way? Well, and I think the question is really easily answered, and we would just think back to, again, what God was originally doing in the first two chapters of Genesis, and as they're expanded elsewhere in the Bible. 
the good gift that was this world. Good and incredible gift. God always gives good gifts. It was given as God's special creation ultimately with his representatives in the earth. But when mankind sinned, it amounted to rebellion against God. Against the holy God of all glory. Mankind rebelled against him. And as the creator, he could have taken the whole thing, scrapped it as if it had never happened, and he would have been completely just in doing so. It was his, after all. And we often have used the language of the pot, pottery and the clay, right? It comes from Romans 9, right? It was his. He could have taken the clay and done away with it, and he would have been just as just. But instead, he subjects the world to futility, but not without a means of hope to redeem it, even from the very beginning. But this world is cursed. It's the biblical language, the biblical idea that is given. We would have to go back to Genesis to look at it more closely, but I think we understand this well. This is why earthquakes happen. This is why famines happen. This is why disease happens. We've thought about disease a lot over the last two years, haven't we? Because this world is cursed. Because of sin. Looking at the created order, there are signs of its beauty all over the place. Springtime, right? We think about new life in the sign that God has not totally removed his hand from the world. Of course he hasn't. If it did, the world would, would fall apart. And yet, even as we look at that, there is also signs of a curse. I mean, just think in our own community. Think back to last summer. It was in August. Six people in our community lost their lives when, with essentially no warning, floodwaters came through their homes and ripped through took their lives. Many others lost all that they own. And we're actually serving right now, trying to help people regain access to just having a, a livable home. So many people lost everything. Right now, at this very moment, again, if we think about the source of flood water, what about the opposite side of that? Right now, uh, firefighters are fighting a series of, of out-of-control fires in Texas. They've already destroyed 50 homes. Right now, while we're, while we're here, they're fighting it, gaining very little ground against the fire. And as a Californian, I have a lot of empathy for firefighting. It's very difficult work. Uh, a, sher a sheriff lost, lost his life in this. And many others are having to flee from their homes right now. In other words, the, the world is not as it should be. Things are not as they should be. The earth was created to be a theater of God's glory to be enjoyed by men and women created in his image. And again, just think about the, the stewardship and the responsibility in a good way. God's saying, go, use this earth, make it yours. An incredible gift. And it's not that that is completely gone, but in its fallen state, it is also, this world is also a place of loss and pain and darkness. In verse 18, Paul refers to this present time. See that there in verse 18? And that's, this is the age that we live in. Both wonderfully beautiful in many ways, but also broken and dark. It's a world where we can look out and smile at children playing, just in the innocence and the beauty of that, of, of kids laughing. And yet we can also look on the news and see scenes of violence and of war. We're seeing that today. In verse 22, Paul says that the whole of creation has been groaning up to this point. And it's key for us to see that every part of creation was affected. It's not like just certain things, like just a moral capacity or just this, but every part of creation was affected. Obviously, the, the natural world itself, I've talked a lot about that, but also the human heart, the human will, as well as our own bodies. And I'm going to talk a lot about that in a little bit. But I want to think more about the earth itself before we get more personal in that sense. So that leads us to number two. Number two is creation is groaning for redemption. Creation is groaning for redemption. And if you glance back at verse 19, Paul says that the earth is eagerly waiting for a glory that is to come. You know, as it is, the, the earth is suffering under this curse, but it's in God's incredible grace. It's bountiful grace that there is a day coming when he says that the curse will be removed. Paul speaks of revealing, the revealing, the revelation of the sons of God. You see that there in verse 19? Well, this, this world is, is waiting for its future glorification in the sense of God's people. 
God's children, his sons and his daughters. If you look at verse 23, you'll see a hint of that there, the way we are adopted as God's children, his sons and his daughters. Through the work of Christ and by putting our faith in him, we can be adopted into God's family. We are alienated now, and yet God says that we can be adopted back into his family. And it's important for us to get this, that without Christ, without what Jesus did on the cross, as we commemorate, you see symbols all over the place, it is the key Christian symbol. We recognize that. Without the cross, we are alienated from our Creator. Not just a little, you know, a little like, ah, things aren't the way they were, but God still loves me and we're still pretty much good. No, we are alienated from God because of sin without the work of Christ applied to our lives. But in him, we can be brought back into God's family, freely welcoming all who would come. And as a part of receiving his children, as I described two weeks ago in 1 Thessalonians 4, and by the way, these messages are really going together. There's a reason that I took time off of 1 Thessalonians so that I could preach this. So if you you didn't hear that message about the very last part of 1 Thessalonians 4, maybe you'll go back and listen to it. I hope it would be helpful to you. As a part of receiving his children, then on that day when he returns, the curse will be lifted. Creation is groaning for its deliverance, and and the sign of that deliverance will be the glorification of God's people. Again, as we'll see in 1 Thessalonians 4, the last part there, seen in Revelation, seen other places, when Christ returns and takes his people. The first time that this word of hope was offered goes all the way back, and I mean all the way back, to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And, and we should be shocked by this that so quickly, I mean, from the very beginning when mankind fell, there already is a word of hope. God began to prepare a way to restore that which had been lost. When I say that which had been lost, I mean all of this crazy chaos that I've talked about up to this point and all the ramifications of it. Just incredible to see God's work in that way. But in this present time, This time that we live in now, creation is still waiting to be set free. Look at verse 21. The text says that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Brothers and sisters, the creation is longing to be set free from, notice, its bondage to corruption, decay. Everything in this world decays. Nothing in this world lasts forever as it is. This decay is part of the curse. You know, we're, we're often tempted to think, and I, and I feel this, I think all of us feel this, we're, we're tempted to think that the problems that we're facing today of whatever sort they are, that they're unique to us, that things are the worst that they could be. Oh my goodness, uh, you know, everything used to be better in the past and, and things today are so bad, but th- these are not new. None of the things that we struggle with are new. Yeah, there's always new phenomena. There's new ways that these things are worked out. But at the end of the day, these problems that we feel, these things that we experience, the chaos and the struggles and the pain, these things are not new. They go all the way back to the beginning of the curse. Creation has been waiting to be set free from its corruption for all of human history. And this is why we experience pain and death and loss. But you see what Paul says? Paul says that the whole creation has been groaning. Look at the analogy that he uses. Like a mother in labor. You see that in verse 22? And guys, let's be honest. This is a category all on its own. We don't understand childbirth. Okay? Maybe I should have saved this for Mother's Day. I don't know. Uh, There there is a pain. There just has to be a pain in, in childbirth that we just can't understand, guys. I think we have to give women that. Many of our ladies know exactly what I'm talking about. Why is this a fitting metaphor? Well, for one thing, I mean, there's several reasons, but especially we consider the fact that pain in childbirth was part of the curse. You read that in Genesis 3, right? That had not been the case before. Childbirth is still beautiful, right? But it is cursed. It is extremely painful. And so Paul uses this analogy, the pains of, of childbirth, and even, even probably implicit in this is the idea of, of the groanings that are coming before, the contractions, the things leading up to childbirth, this, this, this season of, of pain. 
the pain of childbirth are, are overwhelming. I happen to speak here from secondhand experience. I, don't, I can't experience this myself, obviously. But, but it carries with it always, even in pregnancy, right? It carries the hope of new life. The joy of new life. And it's just incredible. I've seen this with my own wife. You see this with others. That, that as much as that pain, that, that switch is flipped when that baby is brought in, right? The new life that is given, even immediately right after the pain. It's like, hey, don't you still hurt, you know, and you're smiling now? So by way of analogy, we, we suffer pain in this life. But it is not without hope for something wonderful that is right around the corner. And if we can wrap our heads around this, this is, this is the application. This is Paul's point here. When we experience pain in this world, when we experience grief and hurt and frustration and all the things that are part of the curse, we can take it as a sign that deliverance is coming soon. We can take it as a sign that deliverance is coming for all of God's children. That is our In the midst of suffering, we're often led to ask why, right? And that's fair. Job asked why, didn't he? Why is this happening to me? Why are these things happening in my community or in my world? It's not always personal. But now we understand better the why these things happen, right? Why the world is the way it is. But I want to take a closer look at a key part of our hope. And so this leads us to number three. And lastly, and briefly, our bodies are groaning for redemption too. Not only the natural world, but number three, our bodies are groaning for redemption too. And so we see in verse 23 that it is not just the natural world. Look there with me. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who, are, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we too groan eagerly as we await, as we, we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, this key part, the redemption of our bodies. And I can't help but think of this as a, as a pastor. I mean, each of us can think about this personally. But as a pastor, I keep a little notebook, a little black notebook until it fills up and I'll get a different one, uh, of prayer needs in our congregation, requests. Some of them are ones that a lot of people would know. Some of them are very private. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I just learned it's easy for me to tell someone, yeah, I'll, I'll pray for you. But I just, in the busyness of life, if I don't write it down, it's easy for me to forget. So I, I write all these things down. And as I looked through my notes, and I was even doing that in my preparation, I, I looked through it you know, on a daily basis, as I was looking through my notes, the, the mountain of requests paints a picture that we can't take good health for granted, can we? When, when we're younger, we almost think that we can, right? We can assume, oh, no, yeah, I'm healthy, and I'm good, and I'm, we, we almost can feel indestructible at a certain age, but we learn that none of us can take good health for granted because reality inevitably sets in. If not for us, a loved one. And I, I constantly think about this. Anytime I'm doing a funeral or with a grieving family, our bodies feel the weight of the curse, don't they? Paul says in verse 23 that our bodies groan inwardly with hope for redemption. And you know, too often, I think this is especially true in our circles, too often we talk about redemption or salvation merely in a spiritual way. And, and of course, there is a spiritual element to it, a really important spiritual element to it. But the Christian hope is better news than just a private warming of my heart. Just me, me and Jesus. He warmed my heart and I, I, I feel different now. That's, that's, the Christian hope is so much more than that. That's a good thing. But it's, it's, so it's not as if God saves our souls and then says, don't worry about your body. It's not as if God says, you know, that whole creation thing and embodiment and all this physical stuff. Uh, what was I thinking with that? Let's, let's forget that. Let's just focus on spiritual things. No, it's not that way at all. This is not just a shell. Your body is not just a shell. That is not a biblical idea. It's an idea that has found its way into our culture, but it is not a biblical idea. The whole, the whole of our bodies are groaning for redemption here. Do you sense that? Remember that embodiment was God's idea. If he wanted to just create spirits, he could have done that. But he created a planet. He created a world. He created people with physical bodies. They weren't meant to be like they are. It wasn't meant that I play basketball, my knee blows out for no reason. It wasn't meant that I get a strep throat. You know, so these things, those things are part of the fall, part of the curse. But embodiment is a good 
thing. And it was God's idea. And the good news is that there is a coming redemption for our bodies that is a part of our deliverance from the curse. Well, then you might say, Pastor, okay, that sounds good, but then why do we get sick? Right? Why why is my body still wearing out? I was feeling it this morning, Pastor. It's wearing out. Well, it's because we're still waiting. We're still waiting for that day that I preached about two weeks ago at 1 Thessalonians 4 when Christ will return and transform our bodies to be like his. First the dead in Christ will rise, and then those who are alive will be caught up too and transformed and given new and glorified bodies. Again, if you haven't listened to that sermon, I hope you'll go back. So important for us, just as a reminder about God's work. And that day is coming. 2 Corinthians 5.2 describes our longing to receive our glorified bodies. You know, because Christians, we don't long merely for our spirit to be kind of without a body. Like, oh, I just got to get out. So again, sometimes we have this idea, you know, my, my goal is to get out of this world because we know there's pain in this world. We know that our body is broken. And so I'm going to get out and then my spirit will be free and everything will be better. That's only a temporary arrangement. That is not our ultimate hope. We, we long for new bodies that will be free of the curse that we experience now. Bodies like what Jesus had after his resurrection, his glorification. And so as we wait, we, we have already received the pledge of the wonderful things to come. It is already guaranteed. If you are in Christ, this is yours. The presence of the Holy Spirit assures us of that. It is our, our, our assurance. It is our pledge, our down payment of our coming inheritance. And it's by the Spirit that we can live for God now as we look forward to that day. But as we go through life now, glance back at verse 18. I, I'm kind of skipping around here, but go back to the beginning where we start in verse 18. Paul says that he considers our, our present sufferings not even worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. If this life is often painful, and it is, the glory of life in God's presence will surpassingly outshine this present darkness that we experience. Not even worth comparing, he says. It's not even worth comparing with the present sufferings when we think about the weight of glory that is to come. Jesus assured us of our reward, that it would be great. He says this in Luke 6, verses 22 and 23. He says, rejoice, your reward will be great. God's word says to us, don't let your present sufferings, don't let the present pain of this life, whether in yourself or in others, don't let that dampen your Christian hope. One day the pain of this life will be but a distant memory. I don't think that we'll ever forget it. I don't think that we'll we'll ever be unaware. I think we'll remember the things of this life because that's part of God's glorious plan that we would remember the deliverance from that, right? You can't know what deliverance is if you don't remember pain. I think we'll remember them, but they will be but a distant memory to us. And remember that the redemption that we await is is not only something that happens quietly in our own hearts. It'll be public. And I mean really public. You're not going to get more public than this. All the world will see as God's people, we be part of the redemption, again, not even just of this world, but of the entire cosmos. All of the created order will be redeemed. Remember, it's not just this world where the, the creation is in chaos. We, we wait for our redemption with a confident hope to verse 24. Well, we already pr- pr- possess an irrevocable pledge. Nothing can take it away from us. And we look ahead with eager anticipation Tom Schreiner, the commentator, gives us this application. It's so good, I want to read it. Given the wonder of the glory awaiting us, we should endure present sufferings with eagerness, knowing that all suffering in the present can be borne because the reward before us is incomparably delightful. That reward will be so good that these other things will be as if they were nothing. So brothers and sisters, Endure, press on, press on with hope that our day of redemption is coming, and indeed it is. 
But this day that Christians look forward to is, is a fate of two destinies, two strongly diverging destinies. We can't uh, forget about that. For God's people, this day will be a day of rejoicing. It will be a day of celebration like we sing about on a regular basis. We sing about it this morning. But we're reminded that it will also be a day of judgment for all those who have not followed Christ. And so as much as our our application here is to endure and to press on, and that's the main thing I want to leave you with, but also we must not forget that as we long for our coming redemption, there is also a fear of holy judgment for those who do not know God, for those who have rejected him. That rejective can be active or passive. At the end of the day, it is the same. So we as God's people are tasked with warning, warning people about the coming judgment. We're tasked with praying for those who do not know God. Because we have to remember that we at one time, we too did not know God at some point. Whether it's when we were very young or whether it was for many years. And so we remember that that day of judgment is coming and we must have concern for those who do not know the lost. But now... We've been adopted as children and we await our inheritance when that day will come. When this world will be renewed, as we see in Revelation 21, when our bodies will be renewed, when all the pain and suffering and loss of this life will be but a distant memory. And so press on, brothers and sisters, and let's pray. Our Lord in heaven, we do ask, oh God, give us hope, give us joy. Our God, I pray that you would give us a sense of just rootedness in these truths. God, that it would put into perspective the the other things that go on around us, the chaos that we see, the darkness that we experience. God, give us a sense of of faith. What a great word to, to use, God, as we sang about earlier. God, give us faith to endure. God, give us joy Give us strength together. Lord, let us help one another through our times of difficulty by reminding one another of this great hope. And Lord, if there is anyone here who does not know you, oh Lord, I pray you would stir their hearts, that you would draw them, God, that you'd bring them to repentance, that they would know this good news, this hope, this promise, Lord, of redemption that we know and that has made us who we are. In Jesus' name, amen.